Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here and checking out the series. Uh, please do hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I got to tell you, I'm so excited and honored today to be have, be talking with uh, with Neil Schoen of, uh, of Journey. Hello. How you doing, Kyle? I'm great, man. Um, first off, congratulations. The band is back. You've got a brand new album and it is as classic as it can be. And I, I mean that in you've made a classic album um, against all of your, your biggest hits. This record is amazing. Uh, well done. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, this Freedom record. You know, I felt like um, we did make a classic record that holds up next to some of our biggest records uh you know escape frontiers and anything that anybody wants to compare it to it's very musical even going back to infinity you know there's elements of everything that anybody's liked anything about journey tried to encompass all that and then we also tried to go into a new chapter of journey and go in some places that we've never been before because there's a new strut you know like in the rhythm section on this this album and uh you know cuts like uh, let it rain and uh, you know all night long uh, and uh, all day and all night I mean and uh, holding on you know they're, those tracks they have a whole different R&B funk rock thing to it uh, that you know Arnell is really enjoying because he's such you know a great singer he's a chameleon the guy can really sing anything you know and I knew that when I found him years ago from watching all the clips uh, that I found on him from Manila in his old band, the zoo, he was singing everybody, you know, mm -hmm. he was doing everything. And, you know, people were going, well, he's a karaoke singer. I go, no, he's not. He's a chameleon. This guy is a total chameleon. And he's, he's a rocker, man. He can croon with the best of them like he does on this record, but he rocks, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's definitely shown people that on here. And so there's new life for Journey as well as classic sounding stuff that they affiliate with immediately and, and can comprehend immediately. Yeah. And some of those songs you mentioned uh, come away with me and holding on. I mean, that, th those are those have got to be two of the heaviest songs, it seems like, in your catalog. Do they feel as heavy as they sound? Where did that come from for, for you? Where it came from is really simple. It's like, we've, okay, so we have all of these hit songs, right? That we play every night. The audience expects you to play them. You have to play them or they're gonna toss stuff at you, you know? <laughs> they're not gonna be happy campers, you know? They pay a lot of money to come see you and they wanna hear what they wanna hear. So you gotta play it. So my thinking has always been, why, if we're gonna make a new record, why create stuff that sounds like material we already have in our set that we're never going to be able to take that out to put the new one in mm -hmm. so what does it do it just sits there and it remains on a record i wanted to write some new stuff that we can actually use in our show so come away with me i mean wow that's a great that's a great opener mm -hmm. for a set to me the way i envision that song is that it just starts jamming and it doesn't go right into the song right away we get that riff going and get everybody jumping in a place. And then it is a song, you know, and then the, the end can be very extended too. It's like this type of jamming rock, you know, like, um, I don't, it, it's just more funky, heavier rock um, can really be used in our set right now. And that's where I was coming from with Narda when we came up with the stuff initially is to write stuff that we don't have, stuff that we can use in the set. Mm -hmm. And so those four songs that I mentioned that are kind of like in a new ch chapter for a journey, that's definitely where that's coming from. Yeah. And and you also mentioned Let It Rain. I, I'd made that note there because it is, it's such a great song. Like there is that blues element to it, but but there's so much more. You're giving so much more than a, than a typical blues song. And I thought that was the most exciting thing for me uh, as I was hearing that. Yeah, and it was off the cuff, you know, I mean, let it rain uh, came out of nothing more than a jam. I brought, you know, I had this the opening riff in my head for for I don't know ten years or something, 
you know, and it was really just uh, instead of using a Wawa, I thought I've never used a whammy pedal before. You know, a lot of people have used it throughout the years. And so I thought it sounded really funky and, and grindy, you know, and it had like a nasty blues thing to it, but still was doing like a, a Chaka Khan thing or, you know, uh, you know, it was it was more like a Prince mixing, you know, Cajun soup of, you know, Prince Chaka Khan and Hendrix like in one mixed with my own stuff, you know, and that's kind of where it came from. And, you know, the coolest thing that we did on this record, how it came about is that it really wasn't planned, you know, nobody thought about it that, that, that much. And when Narda and I worked together um, creating these, these tracks, it was just him and I in the studio. So it was drums and guitar. So, you know, what was cool is that, you know, we were both producing and I'd go, well, what do you want to do today? You want to go back and work on the other track that we worked on the other day and finish that up a bit? And you go, no, let's just move on. What do you got? What do you feel like playing today? And I go, well, I got this funky riff. Let's just go jam on it for a second. So we go out and played what is on the record is the first take of just a live jam. Wow. And then we wrote the vocals around that. And I kind of arranged it as it went down. The guitar solo was played as it is, you know, on the record with the first take. And it was just, you know, I love when stuff like that happens because that's the kind of magic I think that people are missing in their albums that they make today is the liveness in, in you know, between guitar and drums. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of magic that comes from there. And, you know, I know from, you know, you know, loving all of, of Hendrix's work uh, from when I was a kid to going back and even listening to like Electric Ladyland now, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of it came from that place. I can tell that it was him and Mitch Mitchell, you know, in the studio playing and then Jimmy would put on the bass, like, you know, all along the Watchtower, that's Jimmy. And so I did the same thing on a lot of these tracks. I played bass right afterwards just to give it a feel and, you know, my favorite bass player of all time was Jack Bruce. And so Let It Rain, all that Jack Bruce stuff was in there. And, um, you know, I kind of was grinding it with Narda. And then I sent it to Randy Jackson. And he just, you know, he loved what he heard. And he just took it to another level. And so that's kind of how we went about the record, you know, on the tracks that Narda and I created out of nowhere. Um, we demoed him up. I played some keyboards on it. Just what I was hearing in my head at the time before we shipped it off to everybody and have them overdub their own parts. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of made it, it was on the spur of the moment. And, and that's the beauty of it. It's, it, it's actually being created in time. Hmm. And like right now, not from years ago, I have this song, you know, it just, you know, I think that's the only way that you get that kind of magical expression and, and realness and sincerity into the music. Uh, and and uh, so I really enjoyed making this record for real. Yeah, a lot of important words there with, with magic and sincerity and realness. And you're right. I mean, it does feel like when I'm, uh, I'm still a fan of new music, I listen to new music all the time, but I find a lot of the time that that's what I'm missing. I'm missing something that feels real. Uh, you know, that because uh, that's you know, not that you always know, but I think there's something subconscious that you can tell that the people were there, and even as you say, you know, uh, other parts were sort of shipped off for, for people to do in their own place, but there's something in the base of it that uh, that just feels organic, I guess, is the word I'm coming to. You know, you, you <laughs> the computer, you know, the computer, the computer, <laughs> you know, it can be your friend and it can be your worst enemy, you know, that's the way I look at it. Uh, what you can do with a computer is completely phenomenal, you know, anymore. Uh, as far as if you don't ruin your initial picture, you know, before you grasp that picture, you have to imagine it first before you're going to be able to lay it down. You have to see there's a blank canvas there, right? Mm. And I would look at it much like probably like Jimmy Page did when he was creating Led Zeppelin songs, you know, which I really look up to him as an arranger and a writer of having that ability to envision, you know, the picture in his mind before he even went after it. And so if with a computer, 
if you start with a computer, you're already chopping off the legs of the baby. You know, it's a baby still. It's not born. It's just, you know, it's just growing and starting to learn how to walk, let alone run, you know, and, you know, you can really sterilize things by hitting the computer too soon, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great once you, you know, lay down, you know, the real tracks and you what 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 would it sound like if we go over here you know but not beforehand you know that's what i i truly think i think that it needs to live in a real place first before you start chopping it up and then inevitably it's going to get chopped up anyway when they need to make edits for radio right (laughs) because i'm not looking at the watch anymore (laughs) as it's going by like don't bore me get to the chorus you know and don't stop believing it was you know, a classic song like that, that we we weren't using computers and we didn't go by the normal formula of uh, a radio song, you know, it was supposed to be like, you know, verse, don't bore me, get to the chorus, forget about the B section altogether. Just another verse, another chorus, outro, you know? <laughs> oh, three and a half minutes, that's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and here you've got Beautiful As You Are. I mean, what are we clocking in at like a little over seven minutes on this on this track? And it was about nine minutes. And it was a whole nother <laughs> section that I wrote that actually sounds really amazing in a track itself. But, you know, I felt like uh, we were already a double album, you know, as far as vinyl pressing. And if I had put in that extra time, we might have had to go into another vinyl. And so I was like, we'll chop it out for now. But uh, there's been a few people that are saying that that's my favorite song on the record. I'm like, well, I didn't expect that, but it is a sweet. And uh, the thing that's the beauty of that song is that a lot of the, the musical bits that I had, um, the, like the opening verse I'd written like, you know, years ago. And it just kind of sat there, just the chords. And I didn't know what to do with it. So I just left it alone. Like many ideas that I come up with every day. If I don't find you know a place for it, I don't force it. Let it sit there and um, it'll come out if it needs to come out later in the right place. And so um, I said, okay, I have this four verse and then I had this rock and section that I came up with on the keyboards that had kind of a don't stop believing feel but you know a little heavier guitar you know and so then I laid down the rock section then the artist started playing with me and then started I said play it like a a drum solo man let's just take it out and I started just winging it moving the chords around whatever felt like natural and then I just made the bass go with that you know it's like sometimes you just gotta play freely you know Mm -hmm. and that's where the real magic comes from it's not from thinking it's from not thinking don't think just play react um you know use your emotions uh to uh, react to what is being hap- what is happening in the room at the time you know yeah yeah not that it um really harkens sound back to you know the early part of the band but but i thought it's about you know as close as you all have come to to prog rock in in quite a while uh, in, in that sense yeah. um yeah i thought you know this will be my Next year is my 50th anniversary Mm -hmm. with Journey from, you know, uh, the beginning of it with Herbie Herbert and myself and starting in mid-1972. I know it says, you know, on the internet that 73, that it was formed. Journey, maybe the name Journey was, but the beginning of the band started in 72 with Herbie and myself. And so uh, taking all in account to that, I, I felt like I wanted to encompass it all. Mm -hmm. you know and what i'm still really looking forward to doing and i know that we're on our way there because we're selling out these arenas very quickly now and we're going to be going into some stadiums uh 23 probably by the end of 23 and 24 we'll be back in stadiums but what i do want to do is um somewhat what rush had been doing for a long time is an evening with uh and i've had the opportunity to kind of do that in few different situations to test it out uh, with audience and see what they think and they just absolutely love it. And so I discovered that a real journey audience is not, they're not closed-minded. 
Mm-hmm. And we have, a, we're, there's maybe five generations now I'm seeing out there. And uh, what I discovered, man, when I played a few gigs by myself with the Journey Through Time thing, uh, you know, I was in, we were sold out at the Welter in Los Angeles before politically I was taken down because it became too much of a threat. But I, uh, we played, you know, old stuff, new stuff. We kind of mixed it up and played bits and pieces of everything. But I took La Du Da Du Day and I decided I'm going to stretch out on this, man. Like I never stretched out before. And I'm going to go into Jack Johnson, do some Miles Davis stuff, you know, the trippy stuff that I love doing at home that I've never done you know, in front of a journey audience. And I got to tell you, man, I did like maybe 12 to 15 minute guitar solo. That was the most out stuff that I've ever played on stage and got standing ovation. I was like, this is insane. You know, the fact that you can mix, you know, the, the classic hits with the outsideness. And then we did it again. We proved it at Lollapalooza, you know, mm-hmm. with the new band, we went on stage and uh, for, it was a very young audience. I remember looking in. The I time. was part of that young audience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of doubt day. We did that that mm-hmm. night. And I'm, I'm listening to people that had cell phones in the audience from clips they put up and they're like, whoa, you know, the more ad it's going, they're like, whoa, you know, they're digging it. And I'm like, on, this is so cool because there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do everything you want to be able to offer to everyone. You mm-hmm. know, the only thing that's going to stop you from doing that is your own mind telling you, you second doubt yourself, you know, your brain and, and your heart is able to do anything. Your mind is always the thing that's going to second doubt and go, I don't know, should I do that? Maybe not. You know, it's like that whole scenario. And so I try to bypass the mind always and go with the heart, the emotion, and just the now. I want to do it now while I feel like like I, I want to do it, you know, and not talk about it too much. Well, I, I love the idea of the, the evening with, especially revolving around the 50th anniversary. I mean, what is that, uh, you know, as you visualize that, does that put you in like the, uh, the Springsteen, Springsteen territory of like the three hour show where it just, you know, I think so, definitely. We're, we're definitely capable of doing it. I mean, you know, not only do we have Arnel Pineda, who's a phenomenal singer, and now singing better yet than he's ever sung because we got the right mixer in front and got his headset sorted out. Just think about that. He's been with us 15 years, and he didn't know how to explain it. He couldn't hear correctly until just most recently. And I'm like, this is just bizarre, you know? And now it sounds like a record in front every night. Yeah. You know, uh, but not only do we have Arnova, we have Dean Castronovo mm-hmm. has been my little brother. Actually, he's like almost six foot, whatever, but he's been my little brother forever. And, you know, he sings his ass off as well. And then we have Jason Terdlaka, you know, on uh, a second keyboardist that also sings. And so we're we're really, really covered uh, vocally to where it can, the ball can be passed around a bit. And, you know, it's not so much strain all on Arnell to be able to do a three and a half hour show with an intermission in the middle. Um, Plus, you know, you know, when we get to that state, I'm really going to put some, you know, thought into how creating a really mind effing show to where we're doing bits and pieces of where we came from and whether it's just used as a a walking like between songs mm-hmm. there's way the ways to use those musical pieces we don't have to play the whole song you know it doesn't have to sound like las vegas either you know like like a a, a finky little you know cliche you know greatest hits let's just do this verse this course no i'm talking like using obscure pieces that i haven't seen the light of day in many, many years and using it in between songs to make the audience go, wow, you know? I mean, it's all sitting there. It's just sitting there. The only thing that's stopping you is yourself from doing it, you know? That's kind of where I'm at right now. That sounds like one of the, uh, like like the greatest moments of the Who. Like, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Who fan. And like, that's my favorite era is when Pete was really doing that stuff uh, as far as the live show, you know, working that, where everything... You know the, the whole show is like a suite almost, you know? You know what? 
I'm right with you. I was there as a kid. I saw all their live shows and all through Tommy and all that. They were one of my favorite bands uh, that I'd go see. And I used to go see them at the Fillmore West, San Francisco. And I just loved all that stuck with me. You know, that energy that nobody sees anymore. And Journey is one of the bands that actually can do that. Mm -hmm. That, you know, uh, I've discovered. And I discovered a long time ago. We hadn't done it always, but now I've rediscovered it, especially with this new record too. There's moments like that where it just travels into a new place and it wasn't so planned out, you know? And some songs are meant to be like that and should be looser. The environment of the way it's constructed, you know, there's ways of doing it all. You put the parts that everybody's used to hearing, but it's also what I learned from going and seeing Zeppelin and Hendrix and, you know, Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck. It's like, they all did the same thing. They never played exactly like the record. They played, you know, a good portion of the song like the record, and then it would go off on an excursion, you know, in between, going in between songs, instead of a stop and go, let the audience clap. No, fuck all that. You know, it's like, let's just go, go and let them clap at the end. Yeah. You know, I think there's too much, um, you know, time being spent by managers and everybody thinking like, oh, they didn't clap at the end of that. Got to take that out. No, you know, because I was there at those shows for these phenomenal artists that we're talking about and everybody sat on the ground, you know, they didn't clap after every song. And at the end of the night, they'd go berserk, you know, I mean, that that is more of to me what, you know, the first time that I went on, you know, the biggest tour I'd ever done was with Santana, you know, and um, we're in Europe and I'm experiencing European audiences for the first time. And we're in London playing Hammersmith. And, um, you know, they're sitting down and they're very politely clapping. And I'm like, wow, you know, I wonder if they're going for it. And at the end of the show, they went absolutely berserk. And I was like, oh, I get it. It's kind of like what I saw when I was a kid. They're listening and watching. That's a good sign, you know, actually more than just, hey, that's a familiar song and I'm gonna clap and all the way through it. No, make them listen, you know? If you're musical, you can make them listen. Uh, and how amazing is it? How awesome is it that, you know, you're still discovering this stuff 50 years on? Like here you are 50 years and you still get to come up with something new like this that sounds just as exciting. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm so excited about it that, you know, everything goes in cycles, you know? Uh, music seems to go in, in 10 year cycles, even fashion, you watch the fashion, you can almost tell, you know, somewhat where, you know, the younger minds are at and what they want to see. And what I see is a lot of younger uh, generation out there that want to experience what they can't experience anymore with the Who, with Zeppelin, with Hendrix, with, you know, um, early Jeff Beck and the electric blues mixed with heavier stuff, mixed with funk. You know, you can open it up even more than that, though. Maniacs we're talking about were stuff that we saw, I saw when I was a kid, and that you obviously love, too. Uh, but, you know, you can open it up even further more, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's where that this new chapter and journey kind of comes in in freedom to where we got this heavier funk and rock thing going on. And, you know, I've always been into funk. And, you know, before I started Journey with Herbie Herbert, um, I was playing with Larry Graham and Greg Rico from Sly and the Family Stone. And we had a power trio that we had put together that was, to me, it sounded phenomenal, you know? And that's what I wanted to do. And it was, you know, it was very Hendrixy, creamish, all my influences at that time. Uh, you know, I was, you know, kind of like sticking them all in one jar uh, for me as a guitar player, you know, and and using that uh, in everything that I was playing. But Larry singing lead vocals in his baritone voice with that rhythm section was just ass kicking. And so that's what I was going to do. And then Larry got kind of cold feet uh, at the last minute as it was forming more and he wanted to do more of a straightforward uh, funk R&B thing. And so he did, you know, Graham Central Station. Uh, 
which Greg and I took part in for a while. I stayed even longer than Greg did. And, you know, I learned a lot by doing it, by playing some funk that I never played before, hanging out in Oakland with Freddie Stone and at Larry Graham's house and having Freddie rip the guitar out of my hand, go, punk, it doesn't go like that. It goes like this. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it was... A, it was funny as hell, man. I look back on it. They were great times. Yeah, I want to see anybody try that now on you at this point. It's, uh... I'd probably go, what do you got? You know? <laughs> oh, man. Neil, uh, the magic uh, has obviously been there for a, a long, long time. And, uh, and especially right now on Freedom. Uh, again, can't compliment you enough and congratulate you enough on this record. Uh, it's a monster. Uh, and it's so great to hear you all, uh, you know, slugging away uh, uh, this way again, not even just 50 years in, but uh, 10 years after the last record. Uh, seriously, congratulations on this. And, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk about it. Thank you, Kyle. Thank right. you so much. Yeah, we're, we're excited. We're excited to get back out there to our fans. And thank you.